All right. Hello, everyone. Depending on where you are joining from today, good morning, good evening, or from here on the East Coast of the United States, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Axelson and I am Vice President of Advocacy at the Women's Sports Foundation. Welcome to Women in the Workplace, the intersection of sport and economic empowerment. This is a parallel event of the 66th United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Um, and it's great to be with you here virtually today and look forward to you know, future years where we can once again uh, join together in person for these parallel events. Before we begin today, I wanted to open with a comment on our recent world events. Um, on behalf of the panelists today, we would like to acknowledge and condemn the current war in Ukraine. And we stand by those directly impacted by these acts of violence. We recognize the influence of the sports community across the world and call for solidarity and support of those imp impacted, including the Ukrainian and Russian athletes who have courageously taken a position against such human rights violations. Additionally, we join with the many concerned for Brittany Griner's safety and well being and hope for her safe return. Thank you. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion today. This panel, uh, I think, will be a uh, an interesting conversation and we have a few folks with us that I'm, I'm, I myself am excited to hear from. So we know sports offers social and economic benefits for women in the workplace, whether they work in the sports industry or in another industry. And I'm so excited for this discussion to hear from experts from women's sports organizations around the world to offer our expertise and experience about how sport and physical education relates to women's economic empowerment. And so today I'd like to start by introducing our panelists who we will hear from throughout the day. First up is Rachel Froggett. She is Secretary General with the International Working Group on Women in Sport Secretariat and World Conference. Hi, Rachel. Next we have Dr. Peyoshni Mitra. CEO of the Global Observatory for Women's Sport, Physical Education, and Physical Activity. Good to see you, Peyoshni. Thank you, Sarah. And lastly, we have Hame Motivi, Secretary General for the International Working Group on Women in Sport Secretary and World Conference from 2014 to 2018 in Botswana. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. Hello. So, we will hear from all of these esteemed panelists later today. And for right now, I will go ahead and get started um, with some poll questions to hear from each of you. So first we wanna hear, we wanna hear from you and have an understanding of where our participants are from. So please go ahead and, and answer the poll question and tell us what region of the world you are tuning in from today. Excellent. Thank you so much. And it seems like, uh, you know, perhaps some, some of the networks from the folks who are presenting today are representative um, with many folks from North America, but also um, from areas that are represented from our panelists as well. And next up, we want to hear from you. What's your sport? This is a question that we go to often from the Women's Sports Foundation. We have taken uh, the liberty of listing the top 10 international sports. So our apologies in advance if your sport is not listed here. Um, if your sport is not listed, I'd say pick your favorite of the sport that is listed. Um, I see a, a baseball, softball there. That is my sport of choice. Uh, several football, soccer uh, athletes as well. Excellent. Volleyball, basketball, tennis. Great. Table tennis. Excellent. And golf. All right, excellent. That's it's helpful for us to know um, who is joining and what your interests are. Excellent. So we will go ahead now and uh, get started. And I will uh, encourage you to continue submitting questions uh, throughout the conversation. We will have a chance at the end to hear from all of our panelists and. Um, we'll have a conversation with the questions and really um, have a chance to interact. So please 
submit the questions as you have them and we will go through them at the end of the presentations. So I'll begin first. Um, I'm excited to be here today to tell you more about the Women's Sports Foundation, our work, and how some of the sport landscape in the United States intersects with the economic empowerment of women. So the Women's Sports Foundation is a national nonprofit here in the United States that was founded in 1974 by Billie Jean King. And we build on her legacy as a champion athlete and an advocate of social justice um, to really make change and, and empower women through sport and using sport as, as an avenue to make sure that women and girls can reach their full potential in sport and in life. And we do this at the Women's Sports Foundation through three main areas, our research, our advocacy and our programs. And our research is truly at the foundation of everything that we do. And that helps to inform our advocacy work and the programs that we administer. And of course, all of that is supported by strategic partnerships and that can happen at the national level or the community level, whether it's partnerships with corporations that financially support our work or partnerships with other like-minded organizations and community partner organizations that let us do our work in a more um, robust and powerful way. Our partnerships are so key um, to the work that we do. And I'm so thrilled to have you know, our, our partners on this call that help us strengthen our international work and presence as well. So coming from the United States perspective, Title IX is a huge part of the work that we do at the Women's Sports Foundation. And I thought it would be helpful to give uh, a basic primer on what the law is, because I think it does shed some light on how sports um, has evolved in, in our country. So Title IX, you'll see here, these are 37 words. Um, and this is really the, at the very base level, it just says that in educational programs in the United States that receive federal financial assistance, you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. And this applies to sports because in the United States, Sports is part of our educational system and we're unique, I think, in that way from many other countries where sports may not be as closely tied to education in the same way, but because our schools have sports programs and, and sports are part of such an integral part of our educational experience, Title IX does apply. And so as we look at the intersection of Title IX and athletics, there's really three main ways that schools have to comply with the law. And so the first is around participation opportunities. And again, I don't want to get into, into the weeds on this, but I think it's good to give a, a basic overview of this work. So the first area of Title IX in athletics, schools have to provide equitable participation opportunities and that there are three ways that a school can meet that requirement. But at the base level understanding, what you need to know is that equitable participation opportunities are required under the law. The second area of Title IX in athletics is athletic scholarships and making sure that schools are allocating the scholarship dollars equitably between their men's and women's programs. And this, of course, applies at the collegiate level. And then the third level is benefits and services. And that's really everything that else that goes into a sport experience. So the first area, participation. The main thing to note here is just showing that from the passage of Title IX, we've seen an exponential growth in the participation of girls and women in sports. And so you can see the, the line at the bottom of the screen represents the growth at the high school level of um, high school level of sports in the United States. And so in 1971 to 72, before the law was passed, before we really had regulations around how the law would be implemented, girls in high school received about 300,000 opportunities to participate in sports. And fast forward all the way to present day, we're looking at more than 3 million girls having opportunities to play sports, which is fantastic um, and really is a, a key indicator of Title IX success. But one thing to point out is that girls today still don't have the level of opportunities that boys had in 1971. And so I think oftentimes there are conversations and people think that Title IX has taken away opportunities. And you can see that that's taken away opportunities from boys and men. And you can see that that's not the case, that the participation opportunities have grown kind of in sync with each other. Um, and that, you know, girls still have less, do not have equitable access to sports at the high school level 
Um, and even at the college level as well, this graph shows just a few key points, you know, over the last few decades for college sports participation. And again, you can see that there's still, while everything has grown and continues to grow, we do see a consistent gap, you know, over the last uh, couple decades of women's participation versus men at the collegiate level. And this is important, um, again, because it's an educational experience and we know the, the importance of a sports opportunity for those who participate and, and the skills that they learn from sports. The second area to, to mention is athletic scholarships. And again, this is at the collegiate level, um, but generally speaking, schools have, should be ensuring that their scholarship dollars are proportional to their student athlete body. Um, unfortunately, that is not always the case, and many schools are out of compliance with this law on one of, at least one of the areas um, that are listed here. And the, the college athletic scholarships, I think, is important to mention in this context because it truly does impact the economic um, empowerment and earnings of women. And so you can see here that there are literally economic implications for the student athletes that we're seeing billions of dollars that are invested in our educational systems and, and the, the cost of higher education in this country. Um, and so ensuring that women are receiving equitable scholarship dollars is really crucial for the economic implications for those student athletes who receive scholarships. And the third area to mention is the benefits and services. And this really covers everything everything else that goes into a sport experience. Um, that can be facilities, the coaching, the scheduling, whether it's you know, in a traditional season or non-traditional season, the publicity that a school you know, invests in, whether they're promoting all of their teams on social media and in the local paper, or are they only you know, supporting certain teams? And so schools should be making sure that they, according to the law, they should be investing equitably you know, in all of their men's and women's programs. And unfortunately, this is, you know, we often call this the laundry list. This is an area where, you know, everything else that goes into a sport experience is covered here. And unfortunately, I think these are sometimes the things that you, you don't always know um, unless you are literally on the ground and part of that, um, that sport experience and an athlete in that program to truly understand whether or not what is being provided is equitable. And so, this is important because I think we're going to see now how some of this investment, how schools are investing in these teams will translate to earning potentials for women athletes. So I'll cover that in a second. And so, you know, part of the theme today is the intersection of sport and economic empowerment. So I want to highlight a few areas for you where um, I think it's interesting whether, you know, it's women employed through sport, the, the skills learned through sport or looking at sport as a microcosm of society, there are a few key areas that I'd like to point out that really showcase this inter intersection of sports and economic empowerment. The first is what we call NIL here for short, but name, image, and likeness. And what we see, and this is what I alluded to before with the benefits and services, this is the ability for a college student athlete within the NCAA to use their name, image, and likeness to essentially earn money and earn an income. Um, so they can you know, endorse products, they can use their influencer status uh, to strike deals with companies um, and earn income. But so what we're seeing now is that if, they're, if schools are not investing equitably in their sports and are not promoting their sports in the same way, that will potentially have implications for how those student athletes can then go out and monetize their name, image, and likeness. So I think that this is one place where we can continue to keep an eye. You know, we're certainly seeing immediate effects. You can see the, the second example here, the headline from the news where there is a company that was uh, investing in Michigan State University athletes, but did not invest in the women athletes. It was only for football and men's basketball, and that's American football. Um, and so we're looking at name, image, and likeness policies and deals to really see um, the, the equity or lack thereof and how a school's compliance with Title IX might intersect with how some of these deals are coming to be. A second area to really think about and look at as we talk about economic empowerment is, is women working in sports. And so that can be women either, you know, coaching um, or even 
working behind the scenes in sports or working as athletes. And so one thing to point out here is that, you know, as we look to Title IX and all of the gains that have been made through participation, we've also seen um, some unintended consequences, one of which is the decline of women in coaching. And so these two graphs here show side by side how women in college coaching has declined um, since the passage of Title IX. So pre-Title IX, we had 90% of coaches of women's teams were women. And today, that number of you know, women's coaches, women, coaches of women's NCAA college teams is right around 41%. And this is, of course, while the proportion of women coaching men's teams has remained fairly stagnant. Um, and there are a number of things that are at play here, but really, as we look ahead, we want to address the gender bias that you know, research shows does exist in college athletic departments and look at the, the recruitment and the best practices for how to best recruit and retain women in coaching to address uh, some of these discrepancies. And I said earlier about how the, the skills learned through sport, I think it's really important to highlight some of these stats here that are from the EY research showing that 94% of women in C-suite positions, so that's your chief executive officer, or chief operating officer, all of those C positions, 94% um, of them have played sports through that EY survey, is that, that's what we learned, and, and more than half at the university level. And the vast majority of women leaders, women in executive leadership, believe that the skills they learned through sport have helped them advance in their career. So again, this goes back to when we in the US talk about sports being part of our educational system, you know, and, and the importance of that, this is because of the, the, the educational outcomes that we see, the lifelong benefits and the skills learned through sports really does follow throughout someone's entire life and the ability for that to translate into longer term um, success and achievements is really important. And then lastly, I just want to highlight a few areas. You know, we, we normally, we often talk about sports as a microcosm of society. And I think there are two areas where we've really seen this to be true of recent. One is, you know, the focus on mom athletes and coaches. And the second is on the fight for equal pay. So on mom athletes and coaches, we saw last year at the women's final four basketball tournament, um, you know, Coach Adia Barnes had to pump at halftime and it really, it gained headlines and people were talking about it because it was just such a visible um, example of parenting moms and working moms and, and some of the struggles and it gave a face to it. And so I think as we look at sports and how some of these areas intersect, it's also important to look at as sport as the way for us to kind of further the conversation both nationally and globally to really start making change and use sport as that jumping off point, right? It's not about just changing it for women in sports, but it's about using the sports stories that can gain those headlines to really have a larger conversation as a country, as a society, um, to try and make changes and make improvements for all women. And so we saw that with, you know, Adia being a, a mom and a coach and being on such a prominent stage. And we've also seen it with athletes like Allison Felix, who's a mom athlete, um, you see her here with her daughter and, you know, she is a partner with Athleta um, and we have the Power of She Fund with Athleta where we invest in mom athletes and really, um, and that's twofold, right? That's investing in mom athletes and, and allowing them to continue training throughout their careers and, um, you know, ensuring that they don't lose sponsorships when they have maternity and that they don't lose rankings, right? Addressing some of the concerns that we have seen in the past when athletes decide to become moms, potentially even mid, mid competitive career, um, but also using, using those stories and that platform to really have a larger conversation around women in society and how we can make change. And the final area is around equal pay. We have seen this time and time again, whether it's the original nine from the Women's Tennis Association or Billie Jean King's Battle of the Sexes with Bobby Riggs up until you know, recent present day conversations around the US women's national team fight for equal pay, um, that not only is this a conversation around women in sports, but it often will translate and help propel a national conversation and global conversation around equal pay and the push for equal pay. So, you know, and we've seen some exciting outcomes out of the US women's national team 
um, case against the U.S. Soccer Federation for equal pay, and we'll see as that collective bargaining agreement is finalized, we'll see how some of that manifests. But I think, you know, we've seen, you know, the chance at the World Cup stadium, equal pay as a fight for women in sports has really turned into a global conversation more broadly around equal pay for women. And so I think really remembering that we can use sport and we can use the examples of sport to really further the conversation for women broadly um, throughout our world. So I uh, thank you for your time today. Again, I encourage you to ask questions um, in the chat and we will get back to them as time allows. And so now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Hame Motivi. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let me know when you see my presentation. Can you see? All right, thank you. Um, hello, um, like Sarah has said, my name is Khame Mutivi. I am from Women's Sport Africa Network as a Secretary General and also an um, Africa representative in the IWG board. I'm a former Secretary General for IWG 2014 to 2018. And I'll, I'll, be just, I'll just be picking from uh, Sarah's presentation uh, as she was zooming more on to athletes, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about what's happening in Africa in terms of uh, uh, women in sports and economic empowerment. But uh, the, just before I get into the presentation, a little bit background of Women's Sport Africa Network. It's an independent network uh, on women in sport uh, based in Africa. Uh, it provides a mobilization from the Greener Mobilization Platform for collective action and celebrate women in sport in Africa. The network was formed uh, during the IWG and IWG was uh, hosted in Botswana and it was launched during the IWG conference in 2018 in May. And it brings together all the Africa state institutions and individuals to address uh, issues of women in sport in Africa at all levels. Um, so I'm representing the, the network as we, we, we continue to do the work within the continent. And like I said, Sarah was talking more on the, uh, the, 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 the athletes and I'm going to zoom on the, I'll say legacy of Ada Bluji when it was hosted in Botswana. Uh, during that time, uh, Botswana has three legged uh, uh, legacy and we're focusing on the legacy for Botswana and the legacy for Africa as well as, as the world. And in Africa, we saw a lot of uh, organizations uh, being formed, mainly by the women in sports, so that they can provide a, a direct uh, uh, programs for women in sport. And they were run by women in sport. And uh, we also saw a lot of programs, including a mentorship uh, that is currently ongoing through between the Women's Sport Africa Network and the University of London. It is in uh, honor of our co-founder, Ms. Matilda Mwaba. So in her honor, we launched a mentorship last year, November, where we are mentoring young girls in sport in Botswana. And uh, like I said, we, see, we saw a lot of uh, organizations formed in, in Africa that are now focusing on women and girls in sport. But the main gist of this is the organizations are also formed by women in sport. And they are now extending their services to women in sport and hiring women in sport to do the work within the organizations. So I think that one is quite direct in terms of women in workplace and women uh, uh, in sport and also using sport for economic empowerment. The organizations are addressing issues that are affecting women in sport uh, from uh, what limit their growth in sport, GBV, access to sport and education, sexual reproductive health and rights, safeguarding leadership and management trainings. And they form partnerships and uh, that can actually assist in economically empowering young girls in sports in Africa. And also they provide programs that assist the young girls in sport in Africa to turn into professional athletes and end from sport. We know we do have a lot of uh, athletes, especially in athletics from Africa who are doing very well and who have endorsement from Nike, who are working a uh, full-time in sport as professionals now. And uh, we, we know that the young girls, as far as the, 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 the duo in, in Namibia at that age, they're already earning in sport. And I think uh, if you look at Africa setting, it, it, uh, and in trying to, to alleviate poverty in Africa, it's very important that at the end of the day, sport can contribute to make sure that in every family in Africa, at least there's one person who is earning 
a salary to to be able to take care of the family. So in this case, that is where sport comes in because we do have young athletes already earning through sport. And also the organizations are advocating for girls in sport and for conducive environment in, in sport and also offer a program that are direct that can benefit them and their families and also help them to become leaders and also to become decision makers in sport. And these are some of the organizations that are already in sport. Of course, NASPA is, is quite old. Uh, it was there already before IWG, but most of them were formed there with, during the IWG and after IWG. And um, they, they are really quite doing quite a lot in terms of promoting women's sport in Africa. Uh, these are some of the uh, programs, not necessarily all of them, uh, which was in sports management in Botswana, women's a Connect Foundation in Uganda, North in Zambia, Women for Women in Zimbabwe, and then South in South Africa and Somali Women Foundation, as well as Mempro also in Uganda. And they're providing the right skills for economic employment for young women and girls in sports. Uh, employability, like I said, we try to employ, even if I have volunteer uh, to, 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 uh, to offer internship programs for women who are interested in, 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 in working within our organizations. And I'm one of the people who is now currently running a company in sports called Sports Management Agency, as well as running a trust um, in partnership with uh, Tsushima Khan in Botswana. And also that uh, sort of um, continue the conversation around issues that affect women in sport. I can tell you that uh, ever since uh, Arab region, ever since these organizations are formed and then they are coming together to work together, the conversation around issues that affect women in sport has really grown. And we see a lot of women uh, now deciding to take decision-making powers. And also they are able, or we are able as organizations and as individuals to access uh, economic resources for other women to access through our organizations. And we try to uh, come up with programs that are income generating activities. These are mainly to help the women realize financial goals and overcome the, the gender bias uh, barriers that are currently uh, affecting women in sport in Africa. So even if uh, there's not that impact because these are new, most of them are new, but already we can see the effort that comes from through these organizations. And these are, like I said, there, there are quite a lot of them. And if there's no organization, you find that there are a lot of women who are really doing a lot of work. And uh, we, we do have connections through the network with women in Seychelles, women in Nigeria. A lot of women are really doing a lot of work for women and girls, especially to, towards uh, economic uh, empowerment for young girls in sport. And uh, what are the enablers? Like I said, it's because Botswana in Africa hosted the IWG, and there was a lot of work in terms of making sure that Africa becomes very active uh, beyond IWG in Botswana. And also women are now, uh, or sports uh, organizations, uh, even the mainstream sports have the desire to realize the SDGs and to align uh, our policies with the national policies of different countries. So this has already enabled us to want to be uh, to be active because we also want to be counted in making sure that we realize the SDGs. And there's a newly uh, uh, African Union sports policy for uh, SDP in, in, in Africa. So that policy, there's been a very good uh, uh, intention to make it uh, inclusive and uh, the, the, the need to, and they're also interested in making sure that it's, it's gender responsive. So that also will enable these organizations to, to for, for their work to really uh, uh, be seen and be impactful. And then the, ex, the, the program that you support and creation as a similar for economic benefit, even, even if they're outside sports, there's the a growth of those programs that you support for, uh, stim, uh, for stimulating economic uh, uh, benefits in Africa. So these are also enabling us to make sure that at the end of the day, we are able to assist women and girls in sports. And then one other thing is women's growth, growing interest in sports leadership. Uh, we, 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 we are still doing the, the, the research in terms of uh, uh, the growth uh, of women in leadership, but I, I have done a research of impact of IWG in Botswana. Uh, it's still un unpublished, but uh, the results are showing that indeed uh, I, beyond IWG, there is growth of women who are now interested in leadership training and also in taking up leadership. Most of organizations are now interested in women and sport. We are hoping to see a lot of uh, change uh, from that because um, uh, there's a lot of uh, programs that are geared towards women and sport in Africa. And it's only for, uh, 
it's only us that we can take advantage of that and take and make sure that we really capitalize on that. And then there's also um, in, on the 11th of March, Africa Union unveiled an initiative that seeks to enhance the empowerment of girls and women. Um, the initiative is seen to unlock uh, close to 120, no, sorry, 20 billion USD to enable financial opportunities uh, so that uh, by 2030, we can at least have 1 million Africa women in employment. So there's also an opportunity for Africa women in sport and the organizations uh, in sport to take advantage of this initiative and make sure that we run programs for women and girls to also benefit from this program. It's a United Nations program, so I, I think that we will be able to take an interest in it. And then what needs to be done? Uh, we need to position women in sport to benefit from this new initiative by the Africa Union in Sport. And the, the organizations that are, 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 as much as they are new, we need to recognize their effort and also try to make sure that we partner as organizations or also we go out and look for partnerships as, as, a, as, as a group so that we can be able to benefit uh, most of the parts of Africa. And then we need to make sure that we move a uh, sport from uh, amateur, women's sport from amateur sport to commercializing women and sport. During COVID-19, we saw that uh, a lot of women and women and girls teams were mainly were, were affected because mainly they were classified under amateur. And when the prioritization came, the uh, only professional uh, teams were prioritized. So I think commercializing men's sport uh, will make sure that we move from uh, the amateur uh, categorization and we are able to really be positioned well. And uh, the uh, private partnerships is also very important and international programming for economic empowerment. There's always, there's always been a lot of program that talks about leadership trainings that goes about uh, just empowerment, social empowerment, but we also need to go into international programming for economic empowerment and make sure that we understand the so, uh, the background, the welfare of our girls in sport, so that when we, we, we do the, the, the empowerment programs, we know their needs before we can actually bring the programs to them. And then continue education and training through these organizations and through other organizations that are going to be formed uh, going forward. And research of these organizations, the impact of these organizations to understand what uh, uh, impact they are doing. I know Zimbabwe, in the next uh, month, they'll be uh, hosting a whistler in Zimbabwe. I know NASPA is also doing some programs, SMA is doing some programs, and uh, uh, the South Africa uh, Women's Foundation is going to be having a conference in August to do the, uh, during the Women's Month in South Africa, and Africa Network is going to have a conference in November. So all of these uh, organizations, these are all the programs that are really going to be assisting women in sport in Africa to grow. And uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much. And we, we will be celebrating a lot of achievements of women in Africa uh, in breaking these barriers and breaking the bias. And we hope that you will support us and we'll work with us in making sure that uh, Africa women and sport become independent and it grows. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fami. I, I know I'm already starting to, to think of some questions and some follow-ups that I'd love to hear more on. So again, encourage all of you to continue submitting questions. Um, and with that, I'd love to turn it over to our colleague, Rachel. I'm going to introduce myself in Te Reo Māori, which is the indigenous language of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Ina mana, ina waka, ina reo, iro rangatira ma, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Nō ingarangi o kutupuna, I tupu aki o ki te aumutu waikato, nō reira, ka mihi ki te maonga pirongia me te awa waikato, ingare ke tamaki makoro taku kainga, ko Nati Aotearoa te iwi, ko Rachel Froggart taku ingoa, ko taku mahi ki nga wahini ha kina kina o Aotearoa, ko te Chief Executive. Kia ora everyone, my name is Rachel Froggart and I am Chief Executive of Women in Sport Aotearoa here in Aotearoa, New Zealand and also Secretary General of the International Working Group on Women in Sport Secretariat and World Conference which is being held by Aotearoa, New Zealand between 2018 and 2022. I'd like to firstly acknowledge Hame Motibi, my colleague from Botswana, our previous host nation for the IW UG, and also our good friends and colleagues from the UK who will be taking over from New Zealand later in 2022 and holding the Secretariat through until 2026. 
It's my real pleasure today to give you a little bit of background about the IWG and for those of you that uh, came to the presentation that I took part in last week at UNCSW, my apologies, a couple of these slides will be familiar, but I think they are useful just to give a little bit of background as to who we are. Then I'm going to talk about uh, economic empowerment through sport in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So hopefully you're seeing my slides there, are those showing Sarah? Says you've started screen sharing, but I'm not actually seeing slides. Up oh, there, there. Yep. You're there good. Okay. Excellent. Great. Uh, well, first of all, just to explain what the IWG is. So the International Working Group on Women in Sport was established in 1994. So it's almost 30 years old. It is the world's largest network dedicated to achieving gender equality in sport and physical activity. So it's a not-for-profit and it works within the global system and with external organizations to try to influence change very focused on system change and is fully aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So this slide gives you a little bit of a picture of some of the global programs that we run. It's quite a unique organisation in that the global board stays the same and has representatives from all around the world, including five continental representatives and a permanent seat for Women's Sport International and the International Association of Physical Education for Girls and Women, EAPSCVA. Um, but the administrative function, the secretariat moves every four years and each new country has the opportunity to add value and flavour to the work, which is what obviously Hame and her team did um, between 2014 and 18 and our UK colleagues will do over the next four years. So this gives you a little picture of our global network and we think you know to to be a true champion for gender equity in sport and physical activity is to endorse the brighton plus helsinki declaration on women in sport which was established in 1994 and updated again in 2014. there are now almost 600 organizations that have dedicated themselves to this treaty and committed themselves to the 10 principles of delivering gender equality in sport and physical activity. And there's just a short snapshot along the bottom of the types of organizations that we uh, have that have joined the uh, treaty. So where are we now? So we're in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, at the very bottom of the South Pacific. You fly to Australia and then you turn left and you go about another four hours and you'll find New Zealand. Uh, we're a an incredibly diverse country down here. We are a bicultural country. We have our indigenous peoples, the Maori people of New Zealand, but we also have very um, wide migrant communities here. And we are very diverse and committed, particularly to our Pacific neighbors around uh, through the Pacific Islands. Now, about five years ago, Women in Sport Aotearoa, my organisation, was established and it was put together by a group of 22 foundation members who came together in a room and asked themselves, do we think that the, that the sport and recreation system will be able to achieve equity for women and girls by itself, or does it need a positive intervention? And I think it's fairly obvious to say that there was a unanimous feeling that it did need an intervention. And over the last five years, there's been some really significant progress here, which will impact the economic um, empowerment of women and girls across the social uh, landscape in Aotearoa. So I'm going to run through that for you today and obviously really happy to answer questions a bit later in the piece. So whilst the IWG itself has a very large global mandate, we also have this wonderful thing where it comes to a host country and has a dramatic impact. And, and Hame has explained some of the impact that has had in the Africa continent over the last four years. Here in New Zealand, it has been a catalyst for significant change within the system. And as I sit here speaking to you today, we are at the beginning of a really significant uh, wave of change over the next two years. And 
Uh, in the background here, the Inter uh, ICC Women's Cricket World Cup is actually underway. The biggest uh, Women's Cricket World Cup ever in history globally is taking place all around Aotearoa, New Zealand at the moment. The world's best teams are here and there's been some absolutely phenomenal competition being displayed and the, the quality of the cricket has been outstanding and it's lending to a fantastic broadcast package that is travelling all around the world. But what's fascinating is that that is step one of what has become quite fondly known as the Big Four. And in November this year, we'll also be staging the Women's Rugby World Cup here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, followed very quickly afterwards by our own event, the 8th IWG World Conference. And then in the middle of next year, we'll be hosting in partnership with Australia, the FIFA Women's World Cup, which as you know, is now the biggest uh, women's sport event in the world with over a billion viewers at, uh, during each tournament. Now, to give you a bit of a picture of why we brought IWG here. So these are insights from five years ago. So this is what was happening when we began this journey. So leadership for women in sport was, was to be honest, really dire. So at the time, we were only seeing about 27% of all governance roles held by women, approximately 7% of chief executive roles. Coaching, it, it looks good on paper, 30%. But we have a very large, very dominant female sport here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, netball. And once you take professional netball coaches out of this, it drops closer to 10% again. And what we were seeing was that women were primarily taking up functional roles around secretarial administrative functions. When we came to visibility, we, at the time, actually, it was less than 11%. So we've actually slightly moved the dial there to 15. And we were seeing spikes in Olympic and Paralympic years in terms of visibility of women athletes and women leaders in, uh, in the media. And finally, we were seeing participation um, significantly lower across the spectrum for, for girls in particular, but also for women. Now, what was um, happening within all of this means that women were not being represented in every tier of the system, which meant that the economic empowerment of women uh, working inside the sports system was significantly lower than men, but also it was not creating opportunities for women and girls to, to involve themselves in society. And in New Zealand in particular, sport is a very big part of our community and the way that people engage with one another. So these will be very familiar, I imagine, to, to all of you in terms of some of the barriers. So we were seeing societal challenges, systemic barriers and unconscious bias having a real impact here in terms of why these barriers were, were in place. COVID obviously came along and has impacted as well. And actually there's been some updated numbers on this um, just in the last week or so um, that show that uh, even now a, a year on from the numbers I'm showing here, um, it's actually got worse for women. They are too busy, less likely to have the funds available to get involved in sport and less likely to be able to prioritize it over other um, economic issues around, for example, bringing in uh, enough income to support the family, to pay mortgages, to, to buy groceries. And like a lot of other uh, countries around the world, we're also seeing significant issues with inflation right at the moment. So how are we fixing it? This is the landscape that we see now. And over the last five years, we've been able to bring together everybody to really line up shoulder to shoulder to address the issues within sport in this country. So we're very fortunate at the moment to have a government that is very uh, invested into the idea of equity in sport. Our, our Minister for Sport, um, the Honourable Grant Robertson, is also a Deputy Prime Minister. And from the very beginning of his tenure four years ago, he made a very public statement about committing to equity for women in sport. And despite the challenges of COVID, he has not shifted from that position. And that means that the government are setting the policy in the direction of the day. And our two major crown entities, Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand, are investing heavily into resolving participation issues, increasing um, satisfaction across the system, encouraging women into competitive positions, but particularly investing because they acknowledged the research and the insight that showed that women and girls do not get the support that they deserve without the representation and leadership and in governance in particular. 
and Sport New Zealand actually put in place a governance mandate two years ago and instructed all of their funded sports organisations, which is approximately 100 of the largest sports organisations in this country, to, to reach a gender equity position of 40% women represented across their boards. And they incentivised it by saying that the funding would be withdrawn if they did not meet this target. By December of last year, every single organisation except for one met that target, which means that women and girls now have a voice in decision making and investment decisions in the way in which that sport and recreation is delivered for women and girls, and also to make sure that they are seeing and unpicking some of the barriers that are preventing women for take, from taking CEO roles, head coach roles, leadership roles within the system. We obviously then sit there in the middle as the domestic advocacy group and having the IWG here, which I'll come back to. But interestingly, the other major thing that's happened has been the impact of significant influences such as major national sports organisations that have, for example, decided to bring the big four here, so the cricket, rugby and football world cups, netball, our major women's sports organisation, um, still dominating in, in its impact across the society of about 300,000 young girls under the age of 15 who are playing netball on a regular basis. But we're also seeing the emergence of some really significant influences like academic institution, institutions, broadcasters, corporate partners and other key influencer groups. And all of this, you know, shoulder to shoulder alignment is now pressing down onto the system to push through change. And our belief is that, that, that sport is such a visible platform in this country that it then obviously drives positive social change for women and girls as a whole. So my final slide really is to touch on what the IWG role has been within this, and it has been really important. So two years ago, we launched a two-year journey toward and beyond the eighth IWG World Conference, which has just been moved actually to November of this year. It was in May, but um, due to COVID, we, we did decide to delay by a few months. And it's providing a platform to help shape individual decision making. So there's three major streams here. There's the Change Inspires Change campaign, which really encourages storytelling and sharing across the system to, to encourage people to tell each other what they are doing to improve the experiences for women and girls within the system, to learn from one another and to encourage more change and more change. We also launched a brand new platform at the IWG Insight Hub, which is a home for our community of action, which enables people to share their stories even more widely by lo loading case studies and stories and news and research and seminars. And then finally, there's the event itself, which is going to be, I have to say, quite extraordinary uh, and something that I'm incredibly pr proud to be a part of. We have built for the first time for IWG a hybrid world conference, which means that you can be here with us in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, and you can uh, experience the, the event live on the ground over four days in the center of the city. But you can also join us virtually via a world-class platform that is going to enable uh, full integration into the physical event here, but also enable full interactivity. So it means that you, you will be able to engage in workshops online, you'll be able to connect with people from all over the world, you add share your ideas and stories and case studies, and it's going to be quite a vibrant online experience um, that enables people to inhabit an, an online community uh, for the future. So I'm conscious that I am running a little bit over time. So before I show the video, Sarah, I might just check if I do have time to do that. If I don't, what I'll do is share the video afterwards so that people can have a look at that in their own time. I think you can share the video. It's it's short, right? Yeah. Three minutes, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right, no worries. I'll finish off with the video because I think it tells the story better even than I do. Forgive me, I always need to shut PowerPoint. It interrupts, there we go. Okay, machine sound, here we go. Is that up on screen, Sarah? Okay. Small changes can become great accomplishments. Joining from many sources, they flow together 
to create something mighty. Change inspires change. Each with its own story to tell. Stories shaped by people and people shaped by stories. By changing the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Creating champions who don't live by what's engraved in their trophies, but by what's woven into the lives of others. Mamua ka kite amuri, mamuri ka ora amua. The International Working Group on Women in Sport has driven positive change for women and girls for more than 25 years. Aotearoa New Zealand, home to three upcoming Women's World Cups, will host our conference in 2022. The largest gathering on gender equity in sport and physical activity in the world live in Auckland. Or follow the event virtually, collaborating with your international colleagues. You can also join our global community of action right now online. Mentor. Be mentored. Inspire. Be inspired. Sign up now to our tapestry of storytelling, woven with countless threads of change inspiring change. E hara taku toa i te toa takitahi, e ngari he toa takitini. Add your chapter to this story right now at iwgwomaninsport.org. Change inspires change. Kia ora everyone. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's been a real privilege to have the IWG here in Aotearoa and uh, to see its impact across our system here. It's my pleasure now to introduce my final and fellow speaker, Payoshni Mitra, CEO of the Global Observatory for Women, Sport, Physical Education and Physical Activity. Payoshni. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah and Rachel and Kame. Um, wonderful to be here um, and to be listening to all three of you. And I also want to thank Morgan, who's at the back end and helping all of us um, and organizing everything. Um, thank you so much to Women's Sports Foundation and organization. I, I personally owe a lot to having worked there at a very foundational stage. Um, uh, today, um, I'm here representing the Global Observatory, as Rachel just said, Global Observatory for uh, Women's Sport, Physical Education and Physical Activity, um, but we have uh, renamed uh, it and um, I announced it in a CSW event earlier today, uh, re announced it here but we have renamed ourselves as Global Observatory for Gender Equality and Sport. So basically go for gender equality and sport. Um, as far as today's presentation is kind of concerned, I have a couple of slides, but um, I'm also very, you know, sort of uh, keen to ask a few questions to um, my previous speakers, but I believe uh, our, you know, Sarah, who stepped in as uh, a speaker, come moderator, is not going to allow me to ask questions as yet. So I'll move on with um, with my presentation. Um, and that's um, so basically, you know, the, this is an image uh, where I'm speaking to some young athletes, and I thought I would share that with you. Um, if I, what I'm going to do is not. Uh, and it's probably slightly different from my previous speakers in the sense that I'm going to talk about three different stories. Um, and I must say here that the Global Observatory is a new organization. We are just starting to build ourselves. We are building a team. So obviously we do not have uh, a lot of work that we can talk about today, but what I can really talk about is the work that I have been doing last decade or more. And, um, you know, some inspirational stories from athletes I have happened to work with um, and sort of raise a few questions in connection to today's topic about intersection of sport and economic empowerment. I also want to thank Carol Oglesby, I know who's listening to us um, from Women's Sport International, former president of Women's Sport International for being very kind and giving me this opportunity uh, and also because I happen to 
co-chaired a task force at the Women's Support International, uh, about which I'll briefly uh, also speak. Um, so for my next slide, please, Morgan, thank you so much. So here you see the Kuntala Ghosh Tustidar, a very dear friend and former football, we say football uh, in our part of the world, um, uh, soccer is, you know, in, in the US. Uh, so former football captain of India, uh, Kuntala Ghosh Tustidar, with her trainings from young girls who are playing football. This is an image taken from this group called Home Collective. Um, who are working with heads and Kuntala Pushdostida to sort of you know play and help um, some underprivileged children, mostly girls, play football. Now, here the incentive is more about building confidence. Most of these girls probably won't end up playing league. They won't, don't really have an ambition to become athletes, um, you know, sort of professionally. They probably do not look at sport as necessarily uh, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a way to, uh, uh, you know, sort of way to, you know, earn money. But I'll go on to a couple of other stories after this. And uh, uh, let me move on to the next slide and I'll talk about this young woman athlete, Nufisa, who I had interviewed, um, uh, had the opportunity to inter interview um, and with her permission, um, you know, I can share this a few, few lines she told me. I want to dream big. I want to achieve a lot, be, an, be, a, be a great athlete. My mom also wanted to be an athlete and never got the opportunity. I want to realize that my mother, uh, what my mother couldn't. And Nafisa, um, who you know, who lives in Sundarbans, which is quite you know impacted by cyclone. This is southern Bengal in India. She hails from a Muslim family, uh, but she dreams um, of this life as an athlete. Um, she's very young in her school, has a very supportive um, headmistress in school, and with the with help from her headmistress, has found her way to a proper athletic. Um, in a coaching center and is now training. Now, for Nafisa, um, this sport is an opportunity, is a symbol of a possibility, and is also something that will not only change her life for the better, but also probably change her family's life for the better. Um, I'll move to the next slide now, and here I have. Um, a champion athlete, many of you know of her. She was the, you know, she's uh, she was very popular in India as well as abroad. Um, the fastest woman runner in India, um, and also um, someone who came out. She's the, the probably the first and the only athlete who's come out um, as uh, you know uh, as being in a relation, same sex relationship um, in India. And also, Dutti Chand had been to go to arbitration for sport, um, challenging the, the hyperandrogenism regulations of the world athletics earlier, the IWF. Now, Dutti Chand says these lines I never thought I would one day compete for gold on the world stage. At school, I used to give my all for a pencil that used to be the top prize. So, you know, what I'm trying to talk about here is, you know, athletics mostly, and also some other sport like football, as I mentioned in the first image, um, you know, are sports which are often um, accessible for girls and women from underprivileged background. Probably because you don't need a lot of facilities to start with. Um, and also there, you know, especially in athletics where it's not necessary, you don't need an 11 member team. It's easier for girls if they are really motivated to do well. So we see often in India and other parts of the world that young girls and women 
would want to become an athlete. Um, what we see in this particular comment by Diti Chand is that, you know, that prize of the pencil, and you see how little the, the incentive is for a young Duti Chand. Now, Duti Chand grows up to become an athlete, then stopped, fights a case, and is now a very well known athlete, one of the most, in, in, she was sort of in one of these lists of you know, top 50 Indian celebrities. So, you know, she's, she's done really well, she has achieved a lot. Um, she has uh, achieved what anyone starting in the field of sport, probably what Nafisa wants to become. Um, now, now I'll move on to this other, you know, sort of next, next slide and the other story in my last case study by Ken Macy. So all these athletes have worked very closely. They're good friends as well. Anna Tanegesa, who is from Uganda, a former athlete. And I quote her here. Uh, this is from an interview she gave to CNN. I was still a teenager, had no choice because I had a love of the sport and they knew all the consequences which would come out from them. They violated my rights as a human being. They treated me like a guinea pig. Now, why these three stories? I'll first say a few lines about Anat Negesa for those of you who have not heard of her story. An Ugandan athlete doing really well in 2011, 2012, stopped right before the London Olympics, asked to undergo a, a, a test in Europe, sort of in Nice, in France, and after that, advised to take medical steps. And she says it wasn't informed consent because she thought it would be an injection, but she ended up having a surgery in an Ugandan hospital. Following which she needed estrogen therapy, but that was not advised to her. So for seven years, she did not get any hormone therapy, which could have led to severe bone issues like osteoporosis. Um, now, Anna is currently in Germany. Um, she has spoken openly about it because she says that she doesn't want any other young woman to go through this. Now, there is a, why am I talking about these stories is probably what you're going to ask me in this context. It's because of the possibility that I was talking about in the context of Nafisa, in the context of Guti Chang, what she has achieved. Sport has enabled these women to achieve not only great things in, uh, in sport, but also to be, to sort of earn a livelihood, to be economically, you know, sort of be in a better position than where they started from. The, you know, the economic barriers to entry in athletics, as I was pointing out, are lower than many other sports. So we see more when young girls and women from ordinary circumstances coming to athletics. What do they get in Duti Chan's case? She talks about a pencil to start with. You then, you know, you look for scholarships, housing, good benefits, and eventually if you are really successful, it gives you some stable income, which not only helps you, but also helps your family. Um, now, many of these athletes we need to understand, as I kept on saying, come from really underprivileged background. And what we see in case of Anat Negesa is that she was as well like Guti Chand doing well, economically, economically doing well because of her sport. But then because of these regulations, she's kind of, you know, you know she had to stop competing. Eventually her scholarships at the university is stopped. Eventually she's not able to compete anymore. And, and that has an impact not only in her own career, but also in the extended family that she was supporting. Now we also need to understand that in many parts of the world, um, you know, the sense of community, the sense of family is way more important. So impacting her life the way it did, and it's, it's, a, 
clear case of human rights violation. And I'm not going into that because we're talking about economics here. But also the loss of livelihood in this case needs to be pointed out. And in this context, I want to talk about sport and how we see sport. Sport can be an enabler. Sport ha has this immense pos possibility, of, you know, bring, it brings with it opportunities. It helps um, young girls and women from um, underprivileged background to get somewhere. It, it is a leveler in many ways. It, it provides, um, you know, a, a lot of possibilities. But on the other hand, what we see with Annette's story is the fact that it can also take a lot away from her. And I think sport, therefore, can also discriminate. And that is what I wanted to talk about in the context um, of, you know, the today's topic. Um, that when we look at these sort of women, they came into sports for the love of sport, but also to make sure that they get somewhere financially. Some of them are still hoping to, some of them have really done well, thankfully, because of support, and some of them haven't, because sport has taken away something. So, you know, something from them, where, you know, here we see that Anat Nekes are saying, you violated my rights as a human being, you treated me like a human being. So it's such a negative sort of experience that she had in sport. So um, I'll actually sort of, you know, stop there because this was more about making you think about what an athlete is looking forward in sport and what often is the experience. And it's so important for us that as you know, as people working in sport, that we ensure safety, we ensure positive experience for all girls in sport, and girls and women in sport. Thank you. Thank you, Oshni. And I'll ask our other panelists to please come back on and uh, turn on your cameras, unmute yourselves, and encourage our participants to continue asking some questions and and like we've said, this is going to be a, a conversation. So, Payeshni, as you alluded to earlier, I want our, you know, our ability to ask questions of one another. Um, jump in if you have some additional thoughts on on questions that are going out to folks. Um, you know, I think I'll start actually, Payeshni, on on what you the the note that you just ended on. Um, perhaps a little bit more somber of a topic, right? But this idea that sport can both be such a provider, but also potentially take away, right? And, and have some uh, perhaps concerning implications as well. And so one of the questions um, that came in from a participant is around mental health resources for athletes. And so I'm curious, um, panelists, if you have any, any thoughts, you know, I know in the US we've seen some, some recent, you know, very sad examples of athletes dying by suicide or attempting suicide. Um, and so curious to know if you've seen similar, you know, disparities in access to mental health resources for both male and female athletes, or is, you know, is it, a, is it pervasive across the board for men and women, or are there discrepancies in what we're seeing in terms of access to resources? Shall I speak first or? Go for it. Okay, Rachel. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, it's it really the mental health issues as far as sport is concerned came up really sort of, you know, largely during the time of the pandemic, but also because one of the greatest athletes of all time, um, Simone Biles, uh, sort of raised it at the Tokyo Olympics. Um, and there were other athletes across the world who got the strength to speak speak about it because on one hand, as you know, sport has this idea of you know uh, where athletes need to be resilient. Um, their resilience is all, always sort of you know uh, you know championed. You know that's what you champion athletes are all about. That's what we have always learned. Um, whereas you know for the first time. Um, it, we could see that even champion athletes need mental health uh, in support. 
And I think that was really an important, um, I think if, if one of the most important things of last year from the Tokyo Olympics, the most important learning that we had. Um, uh, and um, I believe when it comes to men and women's you know, access to even mental health support, I think it, it, I won't say that it's any different because in countries like India, for example, it's only now that activists mental health act activists are to, to, you know, talking about it. And there is such a sort of, you know, denial of, of it. And there is, you know, and masculinity of some kind is so celebrated that you are not supposed to be vulnerable no matter what. And that is something that's so, so integral to the idea of, you know, being, doing well in sport that we don't pay so much attention. And I won't say that it's any different for women athletes or male athletes, because I think men find it even harder to uh, express vulnerabilities. Mm. And I think maybe I'll add to that, Sarah, um, using New Zealand as an example, we, we have some issues in our system at the moment that we're actually attempting collectively to, to resolve. Um, and the crux of part of the issue has been that our high performance sport New Zealand which is the high performance arm of our system um, was its funding model was tied to success so your ability to to be paid to be a professional athlete you know to be an Olympic athlete or or, or so forth was tied to where you placed in the world how you qualified for the games and eventually where you you finished at the games and we had and it had been rolling through, there'd been a few issues um, going along under the surface and it really blew wide open middle of last year when we had an incredibly um, devastating suicide from an elite female cyclist here in New Zealand, Olivia Podmore, an incredibly, incredibly sad story. And there's actually been um, two major things happen as a result of that. The first is that the High Performance Sport New Zealand system has undergone a full review and has actually been restructured um, and, and re-integrated um, into the wider system. It was acting to a large extent um, under its own uh, guidance and, and, and direction, and it's being fully integrated back into the central system. And the second thing is that um, cycling actually had had a number of issues before um, Olivia's situation and had had a major review and a number of um, recommendations had been made but hadn't been properly implemented. And there's actually been a second review uh, underway. And this time they actually widened the review panel and the chair of women in sport, Aotearoa, Professor Sarah Lieberman has been on that panel. And its findings are actually due, I believe, in the next two weeks um, to come out to actually then look at not just the impact um, within cycling, but, but the ramifications for the wider system. So it, it is a major issue. Um, and it's something that needs to be proactively dealt with by the system. And I think we are starting to move in that direction in New Zealand. There's some positive signs, but um, still a long way to go. Absolutely. I think we've we've seen similar in the sense that it's becoming more common to be spoken about, but I think that it is mm -hmm. still an emerging topic and still something that certainly needs um, attention across the board for sure. And, yeah. and we're starting to see it from some sport organizations. Same here in Botswana. I think we, we, are, we started talking about it, or probably in Africa, but uh, we still have to see uh, the results on the ground. Yeah. So, and again, I, you know, this has been already such a, a great conversation, and I want to be mindful of time. We have a, about, you know, 12 or so minutes left. Um, tons of questions coming in about IWG, both you know from the from the perspective of Hame having hosted and, and the growth that you've seen, and, and Rachel, what we anticipate out of New Zealand um, as you all you know close out your 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 time as hosting IWG with in by the end of this year. So I'm curious. Um, I'm trying to look. At, there are a few questions that have come in. I'm trying to synthesize and see how we can get to to a few, maybe all in one question. Um, you know, Hame, from, from the growth that you've seen in Africa, I'm curious to know, do you think that, how much, how much do you think is based just, is it, is there a larger, you know, change of pace of how women in sport is growing globally? 
versus the fact that IWG was hosted in Botswana and, and had a, you know, the ability to bring more women from Africa to IWG. Where do you think that balance is and how do you think the, the rate of change, where, how would you describe that? Yeah, um, I, I truly believe that uh, there is an impact mainly from the IWG coming to Africa. I remember, I was coming for the second time, but this time around, the impact was very uh, was felt because we were we were intentional in having a Africa legacy, and I also believe that that will translate to Ida, uh, Africa being part of the IWG. I, I'm not going to uh, say uh, for New Zealand, Africa would definitely be in large numbers, mainly because of the distance and for, from Africa. But I also believe that in terms of attendance, even online and going to the UK, because it's one of the countries that are close to us, definitely Africa is, is making inroads. And also in terms of growth, I, I can say, and the organizations around the ones I've been talking about, the growth has gone to probably 33% of uh, women and sport organization led organizations, and including the fact that uh, even the, the government structures, now we find there are women and sport organizations within uh, national sports committees, Olympic committees, national sports uh, commissions. So even the, those are now trying to grow as well. So I'm hoping that this, the fact that those have the uh, funding, we'll see a lot of them also uh, being part of the IWG and growing the IWG and probably uh, you'll see out of Africa at international movement. I'm really looking forward to that and I see that happening. That sounds great. And then Rachel, in terms of, you know, what do you think, have you, like, what do you have a legacy in mind for what you anticipate out of New Zealand? What is your hope for having you know, when, when you get through having hosted IWG in New Zealand, what is, what is the legacy that you hope it leaves behind? Mm. Um, we talk about this often because one of the things I think IWG is amazing at is leaving a legacy behind it where it's been hosted. Um, and you still see, you know, four years after Africa, um, you know, is still very engaged and very active in this space. So the, you know, continuation of, I guess, it being supercharged through the, the hosting of the IWG. Um, there's really two legacy pieces for us. The first is when we took over as host, Women in Sport Aotearoa as an organisation was still very much in its infancy. As, as a research and advocacy agency. And it's, it's similar in um, its approach to Women's Sport Foundation, but doesn't have the 30 plus years or 40 plus years of, of, of experience behind it. You know, we're only a few handful of years old. And so the legacy for us with IWG being here has almost been to, you know, validate and authenticate the women in sport movement in this country to bring the world view to New Zealand, to educate and raise awareness amongst decision makers and leaders across the system, that this is an incredibly important um, issue that needs to be dealt with and that at the time when it arrived, New Zealand was very much behind the eight ball and the rest of the world was a long way ahead and New Zealand needed to start to run to catch up, you know, to in terms of, of, of equalizing the system. I think five years, you know, on from that period, it would be extremely difficult to cycle back from the position we are in now. You know, there's wide awareness, wide engagement. And, and I see Michael Armstrong, and I know exactly which Michael Armstrong this is, a good friend to the IWG, asking a question there about the, uh, the growth of local, local and regional organisations. That's been a huge legacy impact here is that all of the regional sports trusts now have women in sport advisors. There is investment at every level of the system into this topic. Um, you know, the, the national sports organisations are investing from the elite level right down to participation. If you look at the three World Cups, they all have um, legacy programs around participation of girls in football, rugby and cricket. Um, so, again, very hard to, to come back from that, that position now, whatever happens with our government and, and the kind of national policy. The second legacy piece for me, something really close to my heart, every single secretariat hopes to improve the IWG and to improve its reach and to improve its impact um, as it's been passed on. And due to the impacts of COVID-19, we've been in a position to bring the, the virtual um, community into the IWG fold in a, in a massive way. And the fact that the IWG World Conference will be a 50-50 split in terms of its physical experience and its online experience is a significant step forward for IWG. And I think hopefully a legacy, the IWG, um, when it goes to the UK, will be, will, will be taken and grown again. Yeah, I think 
that's certainly super interesting. And I know for us, same as for Hame, right? The New Zealand is a long trip for many areas. Um, and so I think the, the, the hybrid model is really exciting for us and the, the potential to have additional team members be able to join, even if the being able to get there in person is impossible. So I, I would agree. I think that that's a really um, important legacy that New Zealand will add to IWG. I'm curious, Rachel, from the from the policy side of things, the work that you talked about, um, you know, with the ultimate penalty of funding being withdrawn when we're looking at women on boards, that is essentially what the ultimate penalty for non-compliance with Title IX is here in the United States. And we are approaching the 50th anniversary of that law in June. And that has never once been a penalty that has been handed out to any educational institution that hasn't been in compliance with the law. Um, and I think that that's, you know, perhaps part of why we see there are so many institutions that are not actually in compliance because that mm -hmm. ultimate penalty, mm -hmm. you know, has never once been handed out. And so I'm curious from your perspective, you know, is this, is this about the policies that are in place or is it the, the folks in positions of power, you know, the sports minister truly, you know, which sports mm -hmm. minister is a, is a literally a foreign concept to those of us here in the United States. Um, but is it is it about the person in that position of power believing in gender equity and, and using their influence, or is it about the actual policy and really furthering the mission for advancing opportunities for women? I, I think it's both. I think it's a unique situation because of the individual Grant, Grant Robertson who is in that position of power. Um, he's he's very widely regarded, very widely respected uh, as, a, as, a, as a senior leader. He's, he's deputy prime minister, as well as being minister for sport. Um, and he's widely trusted. And so people have this kind of odd um, feeling towards wanting to please him, which is an odd, it's odd to explain it that way. I don't know if I'm doing a very good job, but people do want to meet his expectations and do want to be part of something that he sees to be really important. But second to that, I think, you know, for credit to Sport New Zealand, which is our crown entity here, our, our Ministry for Sport in essence here in New Zealand, um, is that they took his lead and they turned it into reality in terms of policy, uh, a women and girls in, in sport and active recreation strategy, um, a, a, a $13 million investment upfront on the community side and another $4 million on the high performance side. So the money was kind of there, the money was shared with the system, um, you know, people were rewarded for, for good practice, rewarded for, for results, um, but equally there's kind of been, I guess, a carrot and a stick approach in that, you know, the penalty is there. Interestingly, we've never actually, as I understand it, had to apply the penalty. And the one entity that didn't meet the, um, the, the guidance by December, um, as I understand it, had some constitutional issues they had to work through in terms of changing their organisational constitution in order to get the cycle of their board members right. So it wasn't through lack of intent, it was just the, the timing of the cycle. So we've never actually had to see if the penalty would be required because everybody saw the value, understood the direction, and felt that it was important for the sector to go that way. Um, so there's been a lot of, I guess, unanimity. There's definitely been some grumbles along the way. I think as, as anything, grumble, 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 grumble. But ultimately, you know, it, it seems like people have grumbled but got on board and, and, and got on with it. And hey, Oshie, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective of the Global Observatory, um, you know, we've seen that the COVID-19 pandemic has, you know, created challenges for women in sport and physical activity. And so one of the questions is about what can we do to ensure that the gains we've made to date, right, are, are sustainable and resilient to threats like this in the future? Um, thank you, for, uh, Sarah, for that question. Um, and I, I think it came out, uh, from somebody from the audience. Um, I think it's an extremely important question because, you know, so many of us in the women's sport movement, uh, you know, were struggling uh, to understand how women's sport could come back, um, you know, to to us to the stage that we were two years back. Um, leagues were stopped. There was no practice, and obviously, as always 
you know, the moment there was scarcity of funds or facilities or, you know, infrastructure, women's games got affected uh, uh, badly. Uh, now, what? how can we address this? I think as far as the pandemic is concerned, I think one other thing that it made very clear to all of us, and I think that is how we should pitch uh, sport for women and girls, to uh, you know, sort of um, you know, to uh, organizations in power, ministries, etc., is in you know, health and staying fit and active, and it is so important because at the end of the day, you, you can only fight a pandemic if, if you have if you are active enough and healthy enough, and that's that 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 is where we came to you know sort, sort of find. And that is what we understood at the end of this pandemic. You know, well, we don't know if it's the end yet. But I think so being active, being healthy in health, including mental health, became such a issue in the last couple of years. And how can you achieve the, that you know, when you're sort of dealing with the population? How can you ensure that people are active and healthy um, physically as well as mentally. And I think sport is the tool that needs to be used to, you know, to have a healthy population. And I think that that's our sort of, that should be the pitch uh, to uh, sort of governments and, um, you know, sort of uh, across the world. Um, and I believe uh, it's so important that, um, you know, that they also sort of start accepting. And I think UNESCO's, for example, I was in another event before this, and UNESCO's Fit for Life program does very well address this issue that has come up due to the pandemic in the last couple of um, you know, years. And, um, and we should look at this as an opportunity um, to, to sort of bring back sport as a, an extremely important component. Uh, for healthy lives. Well, we are just about out of time. So I want to pause for a moment, panelists, if there's any parting thoughts that you'd like to share. Um, I want to give you the floor. Um, it's not necessarily pressing, but there was a question on uh, if the organizations are partnering with the schools. And I just wanted to say uh, definitely we do have programs uh, that are partnering with schools. Uh, especially rugby in Africa, it's really growing. Uh, we've seen uh, programs running in both Uganda and in Ghana uh, with uh, through rugby and, and, and girls in schools. So, and also NASPA has programs with schools. And we are currently in Botswana through the Sports Management Agency, training teachers uh, in sports organization management, in safeguarding as well as sports leadership. Okay, I just wanted to pause that one, thanks. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll, um, I'll add to, uh, there was a question there from Gianna. Thank you very much. How do we get involved? I think if you're keen to get involved in the IWG, um, the first way you can do that is actually get involved in our community of action, which lives, um, you know, in its most visible form at iwginsighthub.org, where all of our case studies and research and insights are starting to be shared by our network members from around the world. You can you can take and learn from that, or you can contribute your own uh, stories there as well. Um, and then secondly, we would love to see everybody that was here today uh, with us in Aotearoa, New Zealand in November at the eighth IWG World Conference. Um, you can see what that's all about at iwgconference.org. Uh, um, and that is, as I say, both a physical event here in Auckland, New Zealand, but also an online virtual event uh, on a really interactive platform. Um, and we'd love to have people part of that conversation. It will be very interactive. So a great place to, to join in. Hey, Ashni, any parting thoughts from you? Um, uh, I was just looking at the questions and uh, I think Leela um, has asked a question about fit for life, whether that can be taken to Afghanistan. I think this is a question that UNESCO can answer. Um, but obviously we also understand and, uh, that, and acknowledge that um, you know, the development that Sarah, you're talking about uh, since title IX and, you know, and you know, since the 1970s in the US, uh, the way women's sports movement developed in the US and in certain parts of the world is not consistent across every country. 
And we also need to acknowledge that, that we have done a lot, but we have not done enough consistently in all parts of the world. I think also what uh, Hame and Rachel's uh, sort of presentation point to the legacy of the IWG, but what about those areas where uh, IWG has not been? Um, and we talk about, uh, we talk about even you know, when we talk about the Olympic legacy um, or events, you know, we, we often focus on events and nothing to take away from the IWG, but you know, what happens is we miss out on those areas where, um, which doesn't host events. Uh, which are not even in countries which do not have the resources to be able to host big events. Mm. And so obviously we need to acknowledge that there are parts of the world where we haven't been able to reach or we are not able to do enough. Um, and I think in connection to Leela's question, that is what uh, I would like to say. We need to acknowledge that we haven't been able to do enough in certain parts of the world or we haven't been able to penetrate at all in certain parts of the world. Mm. Absolutely. And I think that there's certainly uh, still plenty of work to be done uh, around the world in, in all areas. Rachel, were you going to jump in and say something? Oh, no, I was just going to, I oh, think Pershni, yeah. Pershni's just hit the nail on the head for, for us. You know, I think, you know, IWG has been a, a very um, successful organization in the last 30 years, completely independent of any government or any intergovernmental organization or, or any commercial or sports organization. But it, you know, it has been limited by economic resource. You know, a, a lot of it has been volunteer run, um, you know, so it has, has been a real challenge. And I'm personally super excited to see the Global Observatory or the GO come to life because it comes under the UNESCO yeah. banner and that for the first time I think legitimizes the kind of work that we, you know, for the last 30 years have, have been trying to achieve collectively. And I really wish Payoshni the very best of luck and you have the full support of IWG, Women's Sport International, Episcave, Women's Sport Foundation, everybody. We're so invested in you succeeding and being part of that and, and helping you, um, you know, with the future. And, and we realize you're only a baby, um, but I'm sure you'll, you'll grow fast now. <laughs> yeah, not true, very true, Rachel, <laughs> yeah. Well, we are a baby with a long history, history of more than 20 years. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think from what Rachel has said, uh, the fact that um, Arab WWS was involved in the in, 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 in bringing up the AGO, it means also to be able to get into areas that we never got to, to reach mm -hmm. out. But also the fact that uh, uh, at the, uh, New Zealand is doing the Pacific, not necessarily New Zealand, they're trying to do a legacy within the Pacific mm -hmm. and Botswana did uh, within Africa. So you can only hope that uh, we'll, we'll be able to, to cover other areas through the GO. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I know that there was a, a ton of work that went into getting the GO established. So, you know, kudos was, to all yeah. who were involved in that. And, you know, certainly we look forward to continuing to collaborate, Peyoshni. Um, and seeing the work of GO continue. And um, Peyoshni, Rachel, Hame, thank you all so much for participating in this panel conversation. Thank you to our participants for tuning in and for the great questions. Shout out to Morgan on my team for making sure that all of this ran smoothly behind the scenes. Um, thank you all so much. I hope that at the very least, we will see you whether virtually or in person in New Zealand for IWG. Um, thank you, and I hope the rest of CSW is a success for you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.